started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MinMD Real Talk webinar, Injection Therapy Online Clinic. My name is Austin Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MinMD, and I'm excited to be hosting this session today. Before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. All right, with that being noted, I am pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Joshua Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is a urologist, fellowship trained in sexual medicine, and specializes in erectile dysfunction, low T, penile curvature, low libido, and pelvic pain. And he's located in Los Angeles, California. Today he's going to cover injection medication, syringe and dosing, injection techniques, support options, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the web. Without further ado, I'd like to kick things off by welcoming our presenter, Dr. Gonzalez. Over to you. Hey, everyone. Thank you guys for attending. Um, today we're going to be going over, as Austin mentioned, um, how to use injections for uh, treatment of erectile dysfunction. Before we start, we are going to uh, have a few questions for the audience. So the first question is, how long have you been using injection therapy as a treatment option? Select one of the following, less than six months, six to 11 months, one to three years, or more than three years. Okay, so it looks like a majority of our participants today have been using injections for a relatively short period of time, uh, less than six months, um, with the second group uh, uh, with the highest numbers being uh, one to three years. So it's a pretty, pretty even spread there. Next question. All right, the second question is, have you ever performed an injection on yourself and not received the desired result? Okay. Um, so this is what I would expect, and this is probably why you're attending today's lecture. Um, you know, more than three quarters of the people that responded said that they have had an episode where they didn't get the desired result, and hopefully after listening to today's lecture, um, we can get um, that number down to zero. We have one more question before moving on. The last question is, have you attended one of our <clears throat> previous MedMD Real Talk webinars? Okay, well, it looks like we have a lot of newcomers. Um, so welcome, I hope you get a lot out of this lecture. For those that have attended um, these lectures in the past, um, thank you for returning. And hopefully you gained something out of this as well. All right, so before we talk about the treatment itself, let's um, discuss first how erections normally work. So um, what happens is when men are aroused, the nerves surrounding the penis become active. The muscles around the arteries um, from stimulation from the nerves then relax and more blood flows into the penis. This leads to uh, stiffening of the penis uh, and the rigidity, uh, which we call an erection. The erection then tightens, um, it, disabling the veins from, from leaking blood out. So we ba basically create a perfectly closed compartment where you have blood in and no blood moving out. Okay, so we're gonna go over uh, the medication and how to administer it. So how does the medication work? Well, it increases blood flow to the penis uh, to achieve and maintain an erection strong enough for the entirety of sexual intercourse. Uh, there's a few different medications that can be used, but commonly we use a mixture of two or three medications. Um, one is called alprostadil or prostaglandin E or PGE-1. Um, another medication is called papaverin, and the last one is called ventolamine. So trimix is a mixture of all three of these medications, while bimix um, removes the alprostadil and is just a combination of papaverin and ventolamine. On the right, you'll see some of the uh, commonly available and prescribed uh, bimix and trimix formulas. 
Um, as we mentioned, Bimix um, is papaverin and fentolamine, um, and they are listed here from uh, weakest to strongest. Um, Trimix is the three components combined, again, here listed from weakest to strongest. Um, one of the reasons, you know, a lot of patients I see, you know, ask what the difference is between Bimix and Trimix. Should I use one over the other? Um, the reason that sometimes we prescribe Bimix is for men who may not have that significant of a vascular issue regarding or related to their erections. And also, alprostadil can cause an aching sensation in the penis in about 20% of men. So in those cases, we often will reduce the amount of alprostadil or switch patients to Bimix. Okay, what about the needle and syringe? So ICI medications are injected into the penis using a very small needle. Needle sizes vary in two ways, the gauge, which is the thickness of the needle, and also the length. Uh, the syringe is the plastic part of the device that holds the liquid, uh, and there's printed markings on the syringe that allow you to measure a, a precise dose, which would be prescribed by your physician. Um, in addition to the medication, the bimix or the trimix, your physician should also prescribe uh, the needles and syringes necessary to administer the shot. Uh, the dose volume refers to the amount in milliliters, um, which is the same as a cubic centimeter. And sometimes the needles, sometimes the syringes, excuse me, uh, will have uh, markings in either of these um, measurements. Okay, so how does your physician uh, first determine your dose? So you don't wanna just use these medications without the guidance uh, or supervision of a specialist. So you wanna definitely see a urologist who's experienced in prescribing these medications. Um, and often we will do an initial test dose in the office to, um, to determine what is, is appropriate for patients to use. So um, how, do we, how do we determine that? Well. Um, we want to see the rigidity necessary to not only initiate um, uh, sexual activity, but to complete sexual activity. And we want that erection to go away naturally um, after a few hours. So sometimes there can be some dose adjustment needed. Um, uh, as I mentioned, a full erection that comes down in a reasonable period of time, usually in three to four hours, is the ideal result. Um, sometimes if that doesn't happen, you have a condition called priapism, which a reversal medication may need to be administered. And in that case, we often recommend that patients adjust their trimix or bimix dose down so that they don't have to use the reversal medication. Um, and then we sometimes will have patients adjust their dose up if they only receive a partial erection or an erection that doesn't last long enough for them to complete sexual activity. Um, there's some important notes with regard to these, and this is, uh, has to do with some with safety. Uh, you do not want to exceed the maximum prescribed dose without consulting your urologist or prescribing physician. You don't want to inject more than once in a 24-hour period unless approved by your physician. And most physicians who prescribe these recommend that you don't use these injections more than three to four times per week uh, to minimize scar, scar tissue formation. Okay, so we're going to go over how to prepare your injection. So you're gonna need three um, main ingredients here. You'll need the medication vial, the syringe, and then the alcohol swabs, which are provided um, along with your medication and supplies. So first you need to prepare the syringe, um, which basically means uh, you need to remove the cap and expose the needle. This is an example of one of the syringes that we use. So you would remove the cap, exposing the needle there. You wanna pull the plunger back uh, to the indicated dose. So if your physician recommends that you do 10 units or 0 0.1 milliliters, you would bring it back to the marking 10 on the needle um, and fill the syringe with air. The reason for that is you're gonna actually, you're gonna eventually push the air into the uh, medication. So you then take your medication uh, and insert the medication, uh, insert the, the needle through the rubber part on the bottle. And then you want to push all of the air 
that you drew into the syringe into the solution and then draw back to that designated amount again. This bottle happens to be empty, so I'm not drawing fluid into, into the syringe again, but you can imagine once you push all the air out, you draw back on the syringe and you should see liquid fill, filling the syringe column and you wanna pull it back until the, the fluid goes all the way to the designated amount. If you get small bubbles into the syringe as you're pulling back, you can actually pull back a little past what the doctor has told you to inject um, and then push out the fluid um, to get the air out and so you get, again, back to the designated amount. Okay, so now you're ready to inject the medication. So you want to inject the, excuse me, you want to um, prepare the site for injection. And one of the things that we want to prevent is risk of um, uh, infection. So you need to swab the area with an alcohol swab. Um, you want to insert the needle into the shaft of the penis between the base and the mid portion using a 9 to 11 or 1 to 3 o'clock position. So I'm going to show you using a model here. We are not going to actually inject the medication and I'm going to put the cap on the needle, but I will show you using this where you want to go. So looking at it from the side, again, you're going from the base to the mid shaft. So you're on the lower portion of the, uh, of the shaft. And when we refer to nine or 11 o'clock, if you imagine a cross section of your penis and you're looking at it down the urethra, the one to three o'clock would be here to here. And the nine to 11 would be here to here. What you want to do is avoid injecting coming from the top and coming from the bottom. And the reason is that you have veins and an artery and nerves that run along the top of your penis and the urethra runs on the bottom. You don't want to injure any of those critical structures. So um, in this case, I'm right-handed. I'm gonna inject at the nine to 11 o'clock position. I'm gonna look on the surface of the penis for any large veins and try to avoid those veins and find a spot where there's no veins. For me to inject. You push the needle in and ideally you want to see an indentation in the shaft of the penis, in the skin. That guarantees that the needle is all the way in. You shouldn't be able to see any portion of the needle. And as you're injecting the medication, you push on the plunger and you should maintain that divot in the skin. That will guarantee that the medication goes where it needs to go. So once you administer the medicine, you can pull out quickly and then compress the area, which prevents any additional bleeding and bruising um, at the site of injection. Okay, so how can you avoid side effects from this treatment? So you wanna use proper technique, which we went over, and I'm happy to answer questions um, more specifically about the technique when we get to the Q&A. Um, but one way that we go over this um, is uh, one of the benefits, excuse me, of doing this in the office is we can actually have patients inject themselves in front of us. So we can make sure that not only is the dose appropriate, but are patients able to draw up the medication properly? Are they able to self-administer? Are they um, practicing good technique? And then we can assess their response. Um, another way to mitigate side effects is that you want to, um, see someone who's experienced in this. You don't want to just ask your primary care doctor for these medications because they're not likely, you know, prescribing these medications very often. Another common um, thing that we tell patients is that you want to rotate the injection site uh, within that target area of the penis. So again, you're wanting to stay from the base to the mid shaft, so the lower portion of the penis, um, but try rotating sites as much as you can, whether that be going on the right side, switching to the left the next time you inject, um, or just kind of moving it in a different location on the side that you most feel comfortable injecting. Again, um, we, we don't recommend using these more than 24 hours to prevent long-term scarring. Um, that's another way that we can kind of mitigate some of the side effects. Um, in terms of storage, once you puncture the, these vials, they need to be refrigerated and that will preserve them um, for as long as possible. 
Um, and then there is a beyond use date. Um, Bimix and Trimix multi-use vials are safe to use up to 28 days after the initial puncture, and that should be indicated on your medication. Okay. So here's some supplies um, that can also be prescribed um, along with your medications that can be helpful. So there's, you know, totes that help um, ease with travel. So you can preload syringes and put them in these totes and, um, and you know, throw it into an overnight bag or a suitcase or something if you, if you have to travel. Um, and I get, a I get asked a lot of questions by patients who do travel for work a lot. You know, what if I get stopped by the TSA? What do I do? Um, it's not that difficult for your physician to write a letter um, on your behalf, basically saying that this is a, you know, a medically necessary medication. Um, and to allow you uh, through security with um, your needles and um, supplies and medication. Um, so that's something you should definitely talk to your physician about if you do travel a lot and are worried about getting stopped. Um, let me go back really quick. Uh, there are auto injectors, which can be really helpful for patients who have needle phobias um, or don't like the idea um, of having to inject themselves. Um, essentially what you do is you load load the needle just like we talked about you put it in the auto injector and by pressing a button the medicine gets delivered automatically um, so i've had a couple of patients that have been pretty reluctant to inject themselves they see the needles and they get very timid and scared um, they're incapable of doing it in the office um, who have had pretty good success with some of these auto injectors um, um, and and it delivers the medication without without you having to worry about it. So that's another thing that you could consider doing if you're if you're needle phobic. Um, of course, you want to get um, a sharps container that can be prescribed usually from the pharmacy that provides the Bimix or Trimix. They're also available at most local pharmacies. Um, that is the proper way to dispose of sharps. So once you're done with the syringe, you just drop it in a box that looks like this. It has a um, a closed lid on it and once it's full typically um, you can uh, talk to your pharmacy about sending that in and they will dispose of it properly for you okay so um, I recommend that um, that you guys take advantage of the men MD clinical case managers they're full of uh, really helpful information can answer some basic questions that you might have about you know the medication and how you're how you're using it uh, you can visit the MedMD portal at the link uh, provided uh, or call the number listed to request a clinical case manager. Um, if you are in the LA area uh, or even if you're not and you're interested in uh, seeing me, this is the address where I'm located. Um, it's sort of in the mid Wilshire uh, part of Los Angeles for those of you that live here. Um, the number listed, uh, you can call you know, during regular business hours to schedule an appointment. I recommend that you take a look at my website. Um, there's a whole media section where I have a number of blogs, videos, um, and different um, uh, media that I've, I've put out there to help educate men um, about uh, sexual health. I'm also pretty active on social media. Um, feel free to follow me on any of the listed platforms. Um, we do do remote consultations. Um, there are some caveats to that, but when you call to request an appointment, if you're not based in Los Angeles, we can sometimes work with you um, and, um, and treat patients remotely uh, all the time, so. All right, well, thank you for bearing with me through that uh, in, informative uh, lecture. Um, now, I think is the meat and potatoes of the, of the talk where we're gonna go over um, some questions. Okay, so let's go over it again. So the the if this is your shaft here, you want to go from the base to the mid shaft. So you're just injecting on the lower half of the penis here. Looking down the urethra, we want to inject from the one to three o'clock position or the nine to eleven o'clock. I typically encourage that men use the the hand that they feel most comfortable with. So if you're right-handed, you're probably gonna start by injecting using your right hand. Um, if you can teach yourself, if you're ambidextrous or you can teach yourself to, amp to inject with your opposing hand, um, you can switch um, injection sites by injecting on the left, but you wanna make sure that you feel pretty steady with your hand because the needle is pretty small. 
you want it to go in at a straight angle um, so that you can you know be most successful with your injection so again let's just bring out the vial here so I'm going to take the, the cap off of the syringe I'm going to turn the bottle upside down that's so that all the air goes to the top I'm going to take the needle and put it into the rubber part of the bottle and you're going to push any air that was in there before out into this into the solution okay so now you're going to pull back to the designated amount let's say 20 units this time so you'll pull back let me turn this so you can see it so you get to the 20 mark which is about there okay if you get any bubbles in there you can go ahead and pull back past 20 so that more fluid goes in there the bubbles should rise to the top and then you can push out the bubbles so you get only liquid in there all right we're ready to go so now you pull this needle out you put your bottle down you're going to take an alcohol swab you're going to clean the surface of the penis okay and then you're going to inject using this needle here at the location that we talked about looking to avoid any veins that you may see on the surface of the skin okay so you insert this and i'm gonna there's no medicine in here but i'm gonna push the needle in so you guys can see how to do it okay so you're gonna go you want to go roughly 90 degrees to the surface of the skin you're gonna insert now you should see a little divot okay and you shouldn't see any part of the needle once it's in push the medication in and then pull out quickly put the needle down and compress all right you want to hold for I usually tell patients uh, anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds um, compressing will prevent bruising from forming okay um, and then after the injection you you know resume whatever sexual activity um, you're engaging in and with the stimulation and the arousal, you should start to get a, a response to the medication. All right, and then remember, the ideal dose for you is gonna be a medication that gives you a satisfactory erection and then goes away, usually within three hours. If not, then you, you, know, you may need to lower your dose next time you're injecting. All right, on to the uh, Q&A portion. Great. You said the meat and potatoes. Um, all right, first question here. I've tried up to 60 units of injection medication and still can't get an adequate erection. I've heard that you can combine with a low dose of Viagra. Do you recommend combining these? Um, so you can combine them. What I, what I usually tell patients is that if they're not getting the, the results that they would expect out of what they're currently prescribed. Let's say you came to see me, you said, Doc, I'm using 60 units of what, what I'm, I was prescribed before, it's not working. It may be that you could just increase the strength of the Trimix. As you saw in one of the slides, there are many different strengths. So just fixing that may be um, a better solution. You could try combining it with Viagra, although I find that you know if the injection's not working, adding Viagra is probably not gonna be, not gonna do much. Um, I mean, you could certainly try it. It does slightly increase your risk of priapism because you're, you know, using more than the prescribed medication. Um, so there, there is a slight risk there. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, you know, it, it's something that's reasonable to try, but you may want to talk to doc to your doctor and see if there is a stronger injection that you could use. All right, uh, I think I might have heard you go over this quickly during the demo, um, but we have another question here about how long you're supposed to wait before intercourse after you inject. So I think that one of the best parts about these injections is that you can be active almost immediately. So um, usually within a few minutes, you should start to see the effect, especially if you're in a sexual situation and you know, engaging in foreplay and becoming aroused, medicine works pretty quickly. Um, so it, it has a benefit. Um, it has that benefit um, more than than the pills do. As you, as you know, those of you that have used pills know, often 
times you have to plan ahead of time uh, for sex. So you have to take them 30 to 60 minutes before sex um, for them to adequately work. And this is much more of like an on-demand uh, treatment where you can use it. You can even start foreplay, take a take a you know a quick break, run to the restroom, use the injection, get back in bed, and you're and you're pretty pretty ready to go. So within a few minutes. All right, uh, next question here. If an erection persists for too long, can Sudafed correct the problem? Well, if you have true priapism, um, the answer is no. So um, the you can imagine, again, if we're, if we're talking about this closed compartment, um, that you get blood in because of the injections worked really well, and then no blood is leaving. So that means that, um, taking an oral pill, relying on that to make it down to your penis to kind of reverse the process um, is not likely to work. I have some patients who start to, you know, their erection starts to go away a little bit and taking priapism, um, or excuse me, taking Sudafed will sometimes finish the job. But um, I definitely don't encourage my patients to wait, to, to rely on Sudafed. Um, and one of the ways that you can get around that is that some physicians can prescribe the reversal medication so that you can actually use it at home. So that if you do get into trouble before it, it gets um, beyond the point of no return and you end up in an emergency room, you can actually administer the antidote on your own, which is 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 much more likely to work than suitable. All right, next question here. I had prostatectomy last August and since then, I've had erectile dysfunction. I started injection trimix, injecting trimix prescribed by my urologist. Will there be any chance my normal erectile function will recover and I won't depend on injection therapy for erections? Or once I start, will I depend on injection therapy forever? Um, no, I don't think you'll necessarily be reliant on injections. Um, there's a couple of factors that, that um, play into this. Number one, um, Men who have prostatectomy, um, sometimes the nerves that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture are injured or can it have to be taken as part of the surgery um, for, you know, to make it, to, to have the best cancer outcomes. But let's say in, in best case scenario, it was a nerve bearing surgery, meaning that the nerves were unharmed. Um, even in those cases, many, many men um, still experience some decrease in their erectile function. Uh, usually, Postoperatively, after these kinds of surgeries, whether it be prostatectomy or um, you know a bladder surgery of some kind that uh, can disrupt the normal nerve supply, um, we tell patients it can take anywhere from one to two years to regain their recovery. So you are still within that window. Because it was in fact last August. Um, so there there may be regain of function going forward. So don't don't be discouraged. Um, and it also depends on your performance ability before surgery. If you had significant erectile dysfunction before surgery, um, you know, we can hope that you will recover and return to that function, but um, but you know that that is a is a negative uh, indicator in terms of, of the likelihood that you will recover um, after the surgery. All right, next question here. I have Parkinson's disease and sometimes have a shaky hand when trying to fill the syringe and inject. Any suggestions to make injecting easier? Um, well, I, you know, you may want to consider an auto injector. Um, I mentioned it is good for patients who, you know, don't like needles. But if you can manage to draw the medicine up, um, you know, you can have uh, shaky hands when you're drawing up the medicine as long as you're careful. Um, the real danger with shaky hands or unsteady hands is when you're injecting yourself, sometimes you can't do it properly. You might bend the needle um, and then you're going to you know, either hurt yourself or not get the result that you want. Um, and I think the auto injector would be a great option in that case because um, you can take your time filling the syringe um, and load it into the auto injector and then let the let the device do the work for you so you can you know, guarantee that the medicine gets where it needs to go. All right, uh, next question here. I have a bend in my erection. How did this happen and how can I fix this? Um, well, a bend in, in, in erection can happen for a number of reasons. So um, 
there's a condition called Peyronie's disease, which is um, a curvature. Typically, there's other kinds of deformities that can happen, but you know, classically described as a curvature or a bend in the penis, um, and it's usually associated with scar tissue formation. Now, I don't know um, your background, but I'm assuming if you're asking that question in this context, you're um, you are relating your use of the injections with the curve. So if that's the case, it could be that over time using these injections that some scar tissue formed and that is causing a deformity of, of your erection. But there are plenty of men who have bent penises um, and have Peyronie's disease who don't use injections. So it's unclear to me that it's you know related to the injections, but if you are making that association, um, you may want to speak either to the person who prescribed the medication or um, to another urologist who specializes in Peyronie's disease because there are treatments for that condition. All right, uh, next question here. Can injection therapy be used with the pump method of attaining an erection? Another question that we get kind of piggybacking on that is um, what comes first, the injection or the pump? Um, I, in terms of like using them together, which do you do first? Yeah. Or which would I prescribe first the, to the patient? Yeah, with? The first, yeah, the first question is, can you use them in combination? And the second question that we do get a lot of is, um, which one do you use first if you can use that? Um, okay, so I, t I would say I'm a bigger prescriber of the injections rather than the pump. Um, not a lot of guys that I've treated like the pump um, because it, it seems very procedural. Um, you know, it's 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 one thing to take a break from sexual activity, excuse yourself, inject your penis, and then get right back in bed. It's quite another to put fat, you know, fit a device onto your penis and use it to to maintain an to get an erection. So um, for that reason, I probably would say I I would prescribe or lean towards prescribing um, the injections first. I think it's absolutely fine to use them in combination. Um, uh, many of the, the vacuum devices have constriction rings, cock rings essentially, that you f fashion or put on the, on the base of your penis, which prevents leakage of blood. So um, you just want to make sure that you remove that um, after sexual activity so it doesn't get trapped because you want the blood to be able to exit after you use the injection. All right, uh, next question here. A lump has developed on one side of my penis where I inject. I inject maybe every other week. What's going on? Um, again, it may be that some, uh, you know, some scar, a uh, small amount of scar tissue has formed there. Um, so what I would recommend uh, would be to change where you're injecting. Um, if you've been injecting in the same spot, um, it could be that that's why you formed a little bit of scar there. So I would try to march either up or down on your penis again staying within you know the bottom half of the shaft or try switching to the other side um, so that that you don't have any um, additional scar that occurs but you know if you follow the steps that we went over today i think the compression is especially helpful not only at preventing bruising but i think it helps prevent scarring from from forming as well so if you haven't been practicing the compression after you do the injection i would um, try to do that All right, next question here. Why does the injection not work sometimes? That's an, that's an interesting question. I get it a lot. I think um, that if it's not working only sometime, that, you know, because if someone says it, it's just not working, that might be a meditation problem. That may just be you need something stronger. Um, if it's working sometimes and not others, um, it usually comes down to technique. So that's why, you know, we started, we, we took the time in the lecture to go over, you know, um, in detail how you should be injecting. Um, and things that are really important to increase your success are making sure that the needle is all the way buried into the penis, so you see that indentation. Making sure you maintain that indentation as you're pushing the medicine in. Um, making sure that you, that, the needle goes in easily because if you're going into an area where, as the last question alluded to, there's like a lump, it's going to be difficult to administer the medication. 
um, trying to switch locations, um, doing the compression, all of those things increase your success. And I have found that most of my patients who intermittently don't respond to the medicine, it's usually a technique issue. And so I regularly, when I have patients on injections, almost every time they see me, we just review it. We go over it again. How are you doing this? Show me again. What are the steps? And just make sure that they're doing it correctly. And I think that increases the likelihood that it will work every time. All right, next question here. I get a pain when injecting. What can I do to decrease the pain when administering injections? Um, so it, it depends, I guess, on what kind of pain you're talking about. Um, there is obviously some, you know, quick, very short, mild pain that is associated with the needle going into the skin, although that usually isn't something that bothers many of my patients. Um, there's not really a way to avoid that. I mean, you are sticking a needle in there. Um, Perhaps using the auto injector, um, which administers the, which delivers the needle maybe quicker than you're than you're doing it, might help with that. Um, but most of the time, when guys are experiencing pain, it's related to the medication, and and it's the the component alprostadil that we talked about, which you know in a in a like 20% of guys causes penile ache. So it may be worth talking to your physician. Um, about either lowering the alprostadil component of the medicine or removing it completely and trying Bimix instead. All right, next question here. I need less units as time goes on. Does that mean the nerves are growing back since my prostatectomy? Listen, I don't hear that very often. So um, I don't know um, necessarily what that means. I think that means... Uh, that, that you're lucky, and I, I, again, I don't know how far you out, how how far out you are from your surgery. But you know, if you are within that one to two year window, certainly that could be that could be what's going on. Um, that you are having um, the the nerves either regrow or maybe they're they were just disturbed from the surgery and they're now active. Now they're working better. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, having to use less medication, I think, is is great. So I think I think you should um, I think you're pretty lucky that that's happening because it's not usually what we see. Yes, that's awesome. Uh, next question here: How long does Trimix last when frozen? Um, well, as we mentioned, once you puncture the seal, uh, you're only supposed to use the medication for that 28 day period. Um, so I don't know that freezing is necess necessarily um, changes that. Now, um, what I do tell patients is, you know, if if they're using the medicine beyond that date, um, it essentially is, is degrading. So um, while I don't encourage them to use it after the 28 days, if they are, they may find that they have to use less of the medicine, or excuse me, more of the medicine over time because it's going to be significantly less effective. All right. Uh, next question here. What is the best way to choose an injection site? For me, it seems like veins are in the way of all of the injection sites. So, um, I mean, that's that can be challenging for people who have a lot of visible veins. What I would say is, um, you know, you have quite a, you know, somewhat wiggle room if, if we're talking about the one to three or the nine to eleven o'clock spot so there's there should be some area that you can find um where you don't have a vein when you see the little superficial veins on the skin those aren't as important as as larger veins so if you if you look at my hand here you can see veins like that like that's the vein you want to avoid but on the penis there's also very very tiny little little veins and depending on the color of your skin sometimes you can see them um, on the skin that's not really something you need to worry about it's more the larger veins that that actually cause an elevation in the skin that you want to avoid so hopefully using that guidance you can find a, you know a couple of different areas that that, um, that are amenable to injection All right, next question here. I'm on Trimix and my penis is very painful when it gets erect. Uh, so painful that I can't get any pleasure. I've tried acetaminophen, regular and extra strength, to deal with the pain. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I would say, you know, that that again may be related to the alprostadil component of your of your trimix. So if it's a really high amount of alprostadil, one thing that you could certainly talk to your doctor about is lowering that. Um, also, you know, when men develop priapism, let's say they're injecting too much, um, they can get pain with, when they're erect, and it actually can remove a lot of the pleasure that we associate with an erection and sexual activity. Um, so, you know, you definitely want to make sure that you're not injecting too much, and if you're injecting an appropriate amount, your erection is going away within a reasonable amount of time, um, but you're still experiencing the pain, then I definitely would talk to your physician about um, uh, lowering the alprostadil. I've had other patients who have, you know, used ice um, and, and find that that sometimes helps as well. So you could try that. All right. Uh, next question here. How long should you keep the medicine after opening? I've kept it past the 28 days that are recommended and it's worked fine. Yeah, I mean, it's not something that I would recommend using beyond the 28 days. Um, so it's hard for me to answer that question because that's really, you know, from a safety standpoint, what um, is, is the best medical advice I can give you. Um, like I said before, I certainly have patients doing what you're doing. Um, and it's it, not like the medicine turns into poison after the 28 days, but it becomes significantly less effective. So, you know, again, my best advice would be to really try to not go beyond the 28 days that's recommended. All right, next question here. I recently heard about something called super trimix. What is this and does MinMD carry it? Super trimix. Um, well, I'd have to know what the components are. I mean, clearly the trimix indicates the three components that we talked about, um, the alprostadil, papaverin, and phentolamine. Um, usually super trimix involves the addition of one or more um, medication. So um, atropine has been used. There's some other substances they can put into the mix. Um, Austin, I don't know. I'm actually, I don't think you guys carry anything beyond Trimix. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, we, we carry, I think, uh, 16 or so different uh, variations uh, in strength of the drug. So it's possible right. we have Super Trimix. It's just not called Super Trimix. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think from what I know for men and D, I think they just carry a variety of different trimixes and trimixes. You know, the truth mm -hmm. is a lot of that is um, marketing um, with like the super trimix because it sounds it sounds cool, super trimix. Um, but there's not any like clinical evidence that adding additional components, certainly by adding something like atropine, that you get a better effect. So you may want to just consider increasing the strength of your Trimix rather than adding another component. I agree. It does sound cool. Maybe we should start marketing our Trimixes that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, next question here. I was told to withdraw the plunger while inserted some before injecting all the way. Can you explain why we need to do this? Can you say that again? So he was told to pull back on the plunger before injecting. Yeah, so while the needle is uh, and the, in, inserted into the penis, yeah, pull back on the plunger before injecting. So that usually um, is advice that we give when people are injecting into veins, right? Um, um, or using larger needles. Like some, some guys inject testosterone and we tell them to kind of pull back. Um, that, that's, to, that's to basically make sure you're not in a large vein. Um, the truth is that these needles are really small. Um, and if you are doing your job and avoiding the veins, then you don't have to really be concerned because once you get into that tissue, that's a vascular tissue. So if you pull back, you might actually see a little bit of blood, but that, that shouldn't scare you. You're kind of in the right space if that's the case. So I don't actually regularly tell my patients to pull back because if anything, you know, the pulling back of the syringe is potentially going to cause you to pull the needle out a little bit and that's going to make your injection less successful. So I say once you get the needle in, leave it there and then just slowly push the fluid in. All right, next question here. I'm on a successful injection therapy regimen, but now I ejaculate too quickly. What can I do to correct this? Well, so premature ejaculation is is sometimes related to erectile dysfunction, but it sounds like your erectile dysfunction has been corrected um, if you're responding well to the injections. Um, 
So you may want to speak to a physician about specific premature ejaculation medications um, because there are treatments that, that you could try. There's topical sprays, there's pills that you can take that um, can lengthen your ejaculatory time. So it, it, it you know, can be related to erectile dysfunction, but sometimes premature ejaculation exists separately from that. So one problem you've already tackled, I would talk to your physician about options to, to handle the ejaculatory issue. All right, uh, next question here. After injection, I was bruised all over the next day. What would cause this? I think poor technique. So you may want to review, well, hopefully, you know, you learned something from today's demonstration, but you know, you may want to review it with your, with your physician because um, bruising is typically from, you know, um, improper technique. Um, so if you do everything we talked about, especially that compression, um, then you really shouldn't get significant bruising. So if you were bruised all over, that indicates to me that something went awry. Um, the only caveat to that would be that men on blood thinners, um, you know, have increased risk of, of bruising. So um, it doesn't mean that you can't use these medications. I have patients that are on blood thinners that use Trimix and Bimix all the time. What I would suggest, if that is the case, that you compress for longer, hold it uh, for even longer. You're at increased risk of bleeding, um, and that can lead to, to more significant bruising. All right, next question here. Uh, does the patient's weight have a bearing on the effectiveness of the medication? No. That's the beauty of this medication. It goes right where you need it to work. So, no, weight does not affect how well it works. Um, weight and metabolism and um, biochemistry uh, all affect how the pills work, but the medication that uh, you're injecting is going right into your penis and you know your weight should not affect that. All right, next question here. Why does erectile dysfunction seem to be, seem to affect so many men? Is there an underlying condition not found as of yet? What, um, sorry, Austin, did you say why does ED affect so many men? Yes, yeah, that okay. was the first part. Yeah, so um, you know, ED affects millions and millions of men. Um, and there is a, a number of reasons that men can have erectile dysfunction. So one of the things that I take, uh, take time to do in a patient's initial consultation with me for erectile dysfunction is going over the causes of ED and how we're going to sort of, you know, um, go down the algorithm of diagnosing why they have the problem. I think, unfortunately, um, at least in this country, the way that ED often gets managed is hey doc, I'm having problems with my erections. Okay, here's a pill, here's an injection, good luck. But it really doesn't tell you why a man is having the problem. And if you go to people, excuse me, if you go to physicians that specialize in this space, they're, they're men's health specialists, then they should be equipped to give you a proper diagnosis. So men can have hormonal issues that contribute to, your, contribute to their erection problem. They can have a vascular issue. Um, they can have a problem of their nerves, as, as has been alluded to. Men have surgery that can affect their nerves. Men who have diabetes, they have neuropathies that can affect erectile dysfunction. Um, and then there's, of course, the psychogenic components. Um, so, you know, we really spend some time in my office in the first visit or two figuring out what the problem is. And then I can come up with solutions for what we find. So, you know, maybe Trimix isn't appropriate for for you because you have a re really significant vascular injury and Trimix may not work. Well, we're going to figure that out and I'm not going to waste someone's time if I don't feel like the medicine's going to work. I'm not going to prescribe it. We're going to talk to them about other treatments. So I think taking the time to diagnose the cause of the erectile dysfunction um, helps you come up with better um, solutions. Uh, so there's not just one cause. It's not like, you know, um, we're all exposed to a certain chemical in the environment, and that's why there's, you know, so many millions of men who have erectile dysfunction. Each individual man has his own cause for erectile dysfunction, and it's my job to kind of figure that out so we can come up with a solution for it. All right, next question here. My Trimix medicine stopped working for me a few years ago. Is there anything new I can try? 
Well, super trimix, we already heard about that. Um, you know, I would say, uh, again, you know, you want to make sure that there's not any um, any stronger strengths, like in anything. Uh, if there, if you know, you may be on like the first level of trimix. What a lot of men don't appreciate, and hopefully this came across in the lecture, is that trimix comes in all kinds of strengths. So maybe you can. There's room to to increase on the strength. Um, if you are at max strength then you know again i would encourage you to talk to your physician about why that may be there is a condition called veno occlusive erectile dysfunction or venous leak where the problem is not the delivery of blood into the penis it is a trapping problem and with men who have really severe venous leak um, they don't always respond to trimix because um, they're getting blood in fine, they're just not able to trap it. And the trimix doesn't do anything to affect the trapping. Um, in fact, there isn't any medications that fix the trapping. So um, for those men who may have you know, more severe venous leak, you can try things like um, a cock ring in combination with the trimix because providing that compression at the base of the penis will help trap the blood in the penis better. Um, there's penile implant surgery. Um, which is like the gold standard treatment for men with venous leak. In our office, we're doing something called low intensity shockwave therapy, uh, which has been done in Europe for you know uh, more than a decade um, and is an energy based treatment in office procedure that causes um, the tissue in the penis to regenerate. And so it can it can make you more responsive. Um, to the trimix, um, especially if you previously responded to it. Um, so there, there, there are options. You know, I would definitely encourage you if, if your prescribing physician doesn't know about uh, the nuances of that, you want to definitely see someone who you know uh, specializes in this space. You want to go to a men's health provider to discuss those other options. All right, move on to the next question. Uh, does the penis lose size after prostate surgery? If so, how can I gain length back? Yeah, so yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, and that is for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, the vascular supply and the nerve supply to the penis are often affected by prostate surgery. So men after prostate surgery um, will sometimes complain of atrophy. Um, which is shrinkage of, of tissue. Um, the, the connective tissue, um, the smooth muscle in the penis actually atrophies, and so you get a reduction in your size. Um, another thing, um, and this hasn't been well studied, but I've certainly seen it in my patients, is that when they do the surgery, you get kind of a tensing of all of the muscles that are deep in your pelvis. And the muscles in our pelvis um, help our testicles retract and lower based on how cold or hot it is, um, or whether we're sexually active, they tend to kind of get closer to our body. And they also control penis size to a certain extent. Um, and so when everything is contracted, it kind of pulls on the penis and you get a shortening effect. So those are the two reasons that I typically see when men complain about um, shortening after surgery. Um, in terms of regaining length, it kind of depends on um, how long it's been since surgery. So being proactive about um, improving blood flow to your penis is going to help ward off some of that atrophy and could potentially help you regain some length. So, you know, uh, if you're short, shortly out of surgery, you know, doing things like using a daily um, Cialis or medication that that gets blood flow there, or even using Bimex or Trimix on a regular basis, even not associated with sexual activity, but just to get blood into your penis can um, help prevent the shortening. Uh, you could try using a vacuum device, um, even in combination with those medications, to try to regain some length. But if it's been, you know, months to years since your surgery, regaining that length is going to be challenging. All right, next question here. If I'm injecting a large dosage, can I split it up into two injections and inject on both sides of the penis? Um, you could certainly do that. It's unnecessary um, because the you do have two erection chambers, um, but the, the, the chambers are porous. So whatever happens to one side 
the other side is affected. So that's why you only have to inject on one side. And I would recommend against doing that for the reasons that we talked about, which is, you know, with each injection, you have the risk of developing scarring over time. And whatever you can do to minimize that is ideal. So the last thing we want you to do is have to inject twice every time you want to have sex. So I would not recommend that you split split the dose up and it's not really necessary. All right, next question here. And then we're getting close to eight o'clock. So let me know if you've got a hard stop. We could just do like a couple more questions. Um, but yeah. let me know what your time looks like. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right, we'll do a few more then. Uh, next question here. Does it matter if I'm injecting at the base of the penis versus more towards the middle? If so, why? Um, no, I mean, I think as long as you're saying within the bottom half of your shaft, you should be fine. The only um, the only issue that I've seen come up with patients that inject really close to the base is that you know if they're kind of pulling their penis. Let me show you what the diagram. So if they're kind of pulling their penis to the side and they go really far down. They sometimes are actually getting into scrotal skin, and it's certainly not going to work there. So um, you know, kind of going between the, the the absolute base and the middle of your shaft is probably ideal. Um, also, you know, for men who have um, uh, pubic hair, if they're not trimming, you can it can sometimes obscure your view of the skin at the base, and that's another issue that's come up from my patients. So um, if that's the case, I would just um, you know adjust where you're injecting. But you know, if you're if you're alternating between mid shaft and base, and you're getting good results with both, and I think you can continue to do that. There's no difference. All right, next question here. How do I recover my libido after radical prostatectomy? Good question. Um, well, libido is a complicated issue. Uh, so libido in men is very much tied to their erections, right? Um, so if you're not having good erectile function, that's certainly going to make you less interested in sex. Um, so that's number one. I would say if you're having an erection problem, working with your doctor to fix that, whether it be pills, whether it be injections, whatever you have to do to get your erections working better, that's going to optimize your libido um, from an erection standpoint, at least. But libido is also the product of hormone levels. So many men who are of the age at which they're getting prostatectomies are also in an age group where we see increasing levels of testosterone and testosterone is a very important hormone for libido so it may be something worth checking if your testosterone is um, uh, low normal or below normal adding testosterone may help improve your libido um, libido is also a product of neurotransmitters that are circling in our brain all the time um, dopamine is really important for libido, so there's some off-label medications that we can use to increase dopamine in the brain that can have a positive uh, effect on libido. Um, and then, of course, libido is very much tied to what's going on internally and externally from you. So if you're depressed, if you're very stressed out, which seems like the entire world is right now, um, you're going to be less interested in sex. And I'm seeing a lot of that right now, given everything that's going on. People are really anxious and really stressed out. And they're coming in saying, like, I just don't think about sex anymore. I'm not interested in sex. Um, and in those cases, I can't really offer a solution. I wish I could. But um, knowing that libido, you know, going up and down throughout your life is normal um, may help you feel better about it. Um, and also, you know, low libido can be a symptom of depression. So if you have a tendency towards depression or you have a history of depression, that may be something else worth investigating because, you know, working with a physician to, uh, and maybe that involves going on a medication, working with someone to, to um, manage your depression can often be very helpful to improve libido. All right. Uh, next question here. If this therapy doesn't work, is there anything better? Is there anything better? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah, better or what's the next step after injection therapy? So yeah, I mean, if you're not responding to injection therapy, um, that would that would make me suspicious that you have a penis sleep problem. And as we mentioned uh, in the question before, you know, you could consider penile implant surgery. 
Um, you could consider uh, that low intensity shockwave therapy that I talked about. Um, you have to be careful. There are some um, sound wave therapies out there that are not really legit. So you want to do your research and go to and, and ask really good questions because these these treatments are considered investigational at that at, at this point and are an out of pocket expense. So you want to make sure that you're going to someone who seems legitimate, who's not just trying to sell you a package deal and promising you the world. Um, but you you know in in the right patients, the the shockwave therapy works really well. Um, but you know as I mentioned, the gold standard for someone with venous leak, which is what I would suspect you have if you're not responding to injections, is the is the penile implant surgery. And the truth is is that the satisfaction rate with penile implant surgery is well above 90 percent. So many of the men that undergo the surgery are, are thrilled after the surgery and very, very happy with their sex lives. All right, we got, we'll do the, this, the, we'll make this the last question here and then we'll wrap up the event. Um, okay. So we will ask that now. Is there a limited number of years one can be on injection medication for ED? Um, no, I don't think that there's like a, um, a, set um, limit on the number of years that you can use the medication. You know, if you're really careful and follow the steps that we talked about, you're gonna do your best to, to prevent scarring. Um, but scarring can accumulate over time, even in the best hands. Uh, so some men will stop responding to the, to the trimix or bimix um, over time, or they may find that they're starting to, have to increase their, their strength. Um, but I've had patients that have used, you know, these kinds of injections for decades. So um, it's it, it's there's not a time limit on it. In fact, these medicines have been around um, much longer than even Viagra and Cialis and those pills. Um, so that they're they've they've been used for years. Um, the one thing I would say is that if you're using these injections more than say two to three times a week. You can do the math. I mean, if you're doing that every single week, every single year, for multiple years, that's a lot of injections. And you might be better off just considering a penile implant because it's a surgery. But once the surgery is done and you're healed and you start using your device, you can be sexually active on demand even quicker than, than with the injections. Um, and, you know, have a satisfying sex life and not have to worry about injecting yourself all the time. All right. Okay, with that, that wraps up our Q&A portion of the webinar. And uh, just so everybody knows, we had a little bit more than uh, 100 questions submitted for this. So um, we were fighting an uphill battle to get all those answered, but I think we did a really good job getting a lot of the, the big ones answered. And we hope that you know it covered the topics that you guys submitted. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gonzalez for taking the time to present today. And we'd also like to thank everybody listening in uh, for attending this VenMD Real Talk webinar. Uh, we hope it was informative and you'll join us again in the future. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about injection therapy, you have a few options uh, where you could go. So as I mentioned in the introduction, we've attached the injection therapy guide to this event. If you'd like, you can download the PDF and you can use that as a reference later. Uh, again, that's gonna be in the handout tab in the control panel. Uh, there's also more resources in the Resource Center on Minimity.com. You can visit this page to view instructional videos, uh, more PDF guides, expert articles, and a lot more. So definitely recommend the resource page there. Um, if you'd like to talk to somebody in person, you can also call uh, MinMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the Password Protected Secure MinMD portal and schedule an appointment with one of our clinical case managers. Uh, and as far as accessories go, if you're interested in injection accessories, you can learn more or purchase accessories on the shop page in the MinMD portal. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with references uh, and two helpful resources and links to everything above um, that I just talked about. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, and we will see you at the next one. Thanks, guys.